Um, so in the sixth homework set, what I suggest you do is um, compute the matrix element of, the, of Z between the 310 state and the 100 state of hydrogen, and then use that later to compute the partial lifetime of the 310 state to the ground state, or the, the life, the partial lifetime, in other words, the transition rate from 310 to the ground state. One over that gives you the lifetime if the warrant of 2s state. Um, and so that's an upper, that's a lower, that's an upper bound on the lifetime of the 310 state. Well, the thing is obviously spherically symmetric. So um, it's an upper bound on the lifetime of all of 31 uh, states. So today I want to do um, uh, spontaneous emission from the 210 state, and that'll be a calculation you can imitate to do the sixth homework assignment, at least the first two problems of the sixth homework assignment. And um, so then at this time, I'll start the ionization of uh, atomic hydrogen ground state in its ground state. OK. So a spontaneous emission. Um, remember that uh, LF is LI plus or minus 1 uh, because of angular momentum and parity in the dipole process. More generally, in the uh, other rates that are about a million times slower, remember k dot x is 1 over 1,000, but it gets squared. So when you square it, it's 1 over a million. Um, and the other one is, um, well, mf is equal to mi if you use uh, z as the matrix element. Otherwise, it's mi or mi plus or minus 1. So those are the um, uh, selection rules in the dipole approximation. And um, we're starting with the state 2, 1, and just for simplicity, I'm taking 0 as the state. And that's going to go to the ground state 1, 0, 0, and a photon of momentum k. Um, so that's the transition. And remember where both of these are eigenstates of 80m plus 80 field, the matter in the field Hamiltonian. Although actually part of the matter Hamiltonian is actually the scalar part of the scalar potential part of the field Hamiltonian. That is to say the the uh, the E squared longitudinal, because of Gauss's law and the Coulomb gauge condition, gets turned into the uh, E minus E squared over R. So what we're computing here for 1, 0, 0, K, S of T is 0, 2, 1, 0. This thing, as usual, is minus I over H bar, integral 0 to T, and then it's 1, 0, 0, K, e to the i, h0m plus h0f t times over h bar. The potential is minus 2 over m, <coughs> a of x and 0 dot p. And then, wow, big typo here. Big, big typo. Minus i, h0m plus h0f T prime over H bar DT prime. So I somehow left this factor out in the, um, in the uh, it just remind me myself where this kind of is on the paper kind of notes. All right. 
So that's the expression. And of course, the field A of X and 0, this is the transverse field in the Coulomb gauge. It's the sum of momenta, which are box one times the polarization. There are only two left in the Coulomb gauge. There's a fudge factor, which is the square root of H bar over 2 epsilon 0 D omega K to the 1 half. And then we have epsilon R of K, A sub R of K, E to the I K dot X plus epsilon sub R star of K, A sub R dagger of K, E to the minus I K dot X. OK, so that's the computation there. I think the one way of systematizing these things is to call this thing F over fudge factor. But it's a lot more than fudge factor. It's actually a computed quantity rather than a parameter. But it might simplify the calculation by using that abbreviation. Now, remember the annihilation creation operator is such that the matrix element, this matrix element is delta R, R prime, delta K, K prime. And it's chronic delta because we have box quantization. Otherwise, it would be a delta Q of K minus K prime. And wow, this type of property is extremely terrible. No, no, it doesn't. The next line. OK, so taking advantage of the fact that these states are eigenstates of these Hamiltonians, what we get is that 1, 0, 0, K, S, T, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0 is, well, I have 2, 1, M actually in the calculation. Maybe I should leave it as 2, 1, M. It clearly doesn't make any difference because the ground state is, wow, here's a typo. There's a 2, 1, M state here. OK, so then this is I, Q over H bar M. And maybe I'll use that abbreviation, F for that square root. And then E to the I, P1 plus H bar omega minus P2, T prime over H bar, 0, T. And then the matrix element, 1, 0, 0, epsilon R star dot P, E to the minus I, K dot X, 2, 1, M, T, T prime. I could, I should have and could have factored this matrix element out of the integral because it's obviously not time dependent once one factors out this exponential. And so this thing is then, when we do the integral, you get an I over H bar in the denominator which cancels this I over H bar. So this thing is Q over M times this factor F. Then the matrix element, 1, 0, 0, T R star dot P, T minus I, K dot X, 2, 1, M. And then this integral over time gives us this E to the I, T1 plus H bar omega minus T2, T minus 1, all that over E1 plus H bar omega minus T2. OK, so that's the whole expression. 
probability is the square of this thing. And so that's Q over Q squared over N squared, F squared, the matrix element squared. Let's do another type on here. Notice that because this matrix element is squared, this is always happens in quantum mechanics. The amplitude is squared. You get a probability. That means the coupling constants here come in as a square, and the dipole approximation terms come in as a square. And so that's what makes the dipole approximation so good. And that also is what makes quantum electrodynamics so accurate, because the coupling constants effectively 1 over 137. Well, I should say the square of the coupling constants is 1 over 137. And so the power series of that, you pretty soon get very good accuracy. Where did the epsilon r term go? There, I see. You have the epsilon r star. This one here? Yeah. No, the back. Back. Right there. That one is missing from your next statement. This is epsilon sub r of k, and this is epsilon r of star. Right. So epsilon r of star is up there. Yeah. And I don't see epsilon r. And I'm assuming it's because a is not something. Oh, it's because, you see, this thing, all of this is part of a. A sits between a state of one photon here and a state of zero photons there. So the only operator that survives is the creation operator, the one that creates the photon. The annihilation operator would act on the vacuum and just give you zero. Okay. Good question. I'm running out of chocolate. But I've got three left, so I can probably be solvent during this lecture. Okay. So the rest of this, I haven't finished writing down the probability. We've got that. And then we have this thing. If you multiply it by half of the space, by this, the square root of the space factor, you get a sine times 2i. When you square it, you get a factor of 4. Sine squared, e1 plus h bar omega minus e2, divided by 2h bar. It's a half angle. And then you have that divided by the square root of the energy denominator. Okay. And remember, we have our magic delta function formula, which says that this part here that the limit as t goes to infinity of the stuff in curly brackets, well, without the 4, actually. Let's see. It's only for the 4. With the stuff in curly brackets is pi t over 2h bar delta of the energy miss, the difference between the initial and final state's energy, the initial state energy being e2, the final state energy being e1 atomic plus h bar omega for the emitted photon. Okay. So when we make that substitution, we get an expression for the rate, which we then have to multiply by the density of final states and sum over those final states. So what we get then is that the rate is the time derivative of increase in the probability. And there are a couple of 2s in the denominator. And I'm going to have to abandon my f business now and just go to pi q squared over m squared epsilon 0 v omega q 
became a matrix element of the square root. And, in fact, I could have skipped a step because the next thing is just to use this rule of four to turn the square of the electric charge into the fine structure constant alpha, which is 1 over 137, h bar and c, 4 pi, and epsilon zero. And so that gets us into, well, we were in SI units, but it sort of keeps us, keeps us there. Anyway, so W hat then is 4 pi squared alpha h bar c over m squared b omega k. This is the energy of the final photon. 1, 0, 0, epsilon star r k plus b. Okay, so that's the expression. And now what we do is, of course, we say, well, remember as when we did the absorption of the photon, p we can rewrite as m over i h bar times the commutator of x with h zero matter. And that would be a step backwards. But we've got eigenstates of h zero matter on both sides of this matrix element. And once again, that wouldn't be much help. But we're going to make the dipole approximation and replace e to the i in minus i k dot x just by 1. And that means that in other words, we're also going to say e to the minus i k dot x is equal to 1 plus i k dot i. That would be a laughable approximation if it weren't for the fact that we're talking about optical photons and atoms. In the next topic, when we discuss the ionization of hydrogen, we're not going to be able to make the dipole approximation because the photon is going to have to be higher in energy, at least 13.6 eV, and possibly higher if it's going to kick it into one of the way up into the continuum. And in that case, e to the i k dot x doesn't work. And moreover, it also isn't going to work in that case because the final state, although the initial state is 1, 0, 0, the final state is the same way as the electron going out. All right, in any event, after we've made these two approximations, then what we can say is that w hat is 4 pi squared alpha h bar c over m squared v omega k 1, 0, 0, m over i h bar epsilon epsilon star k dot x commutator h 0 m to 1 m. Of course, replacing p by this isn't an approximation, but dropping the rest of the dipole approximation certainly is. Okay, so well, I forgot the delta function.
Okay, well, this double function is going to enforce energy conservation. And before I get to that, let's just pull this out. We're going to pull out the M and the IH bar, which becomes N squared, canceling this M squared and then an H bar squared down here. And then it's going to give us, to the right, it's going to be E2, to the left E1, so it's going to give us E2 minus E1. And so that tells us then that W hat is 4 pi squared alpha C over H bar of B omega K E2 minus E1 squared 1, 0, 0, epsilon R star K dot X 2, 1, M squared and then delta E1 plus H bar omega minus E2. Okay, now this delta function acts to ensure that omega K is the same as E2 minus E1. And so what we can do is simply cancel the E2, the 1, E2 minus E1s and the omega, and that gives us a slightly simple formula. Okay, well that's going to be our final formula for the moment. What we're going to do now is look at the matrix element. And now, as I said before at the beginning of the hour, this initial state here, or the final state, is a photon going out in some direction. And the 2, 1, M, we can choose our coordinate system. We're going to choose our coordinate system so that the initial state has M equal to 0. And so that amounts to a coordinate system choice. So that will be the Z axis and everything else will follow from that. Now we want to compute what this thing, what this 2, 1, 0 is. And for that we're going to use a couple of formulas, namely R1, 0 of R is 2 over E0 to the 3 halves. E B minus R over E0 and R2, 1 of R is 1 over root 3, 1 over 2, A0 to the 3 halves, R over A0, E to the minus R over 2, A0. I suppose it would have been more attractive to put a 2 here and a 2 there. Also, the angular part here is Y0, 0, which is 1 over the square root of 4 pi. And the angular part here, right down here, Y1, 0, is square root of 3 over 4 pi cosine theta. So, to find this matrix element, then, if this thing is a 0, then the only part that survives here is the Z component. The reason for that is that this is invariant under rotations about Z. This is invariant under rotations about Z. So if you have an X or a Y here, you can rotate it around X into minus X, Y into minus Y. So the only thing that survives is Z. 
Is that clear, or do you want me to show it more carefully? All right, so only the Z component survives. So what we've got, then, is we need to compute. In other words, we can say 1, 0, 0, epsilon r star of k dot x, 2, 1, 0, is equal to epsilon sub r star of k sub 3 times 1, 0, 0, Z, 2, 1, 0. And now we can just compute this. And so we have, whoops, that's a 1. is an integral of the omega integral 0 to infinity r squared dr. And then we have the 1, 0 wave function. Which is 2 over a 0 to the 3 halves e minus r over a 0 divided by square root of 4 pi. Then Z is r cosine theta. And then the r 2, 1 is e to the minus r over 2 a 0 divided by root 3, 2 a 0 to the 3 halves r over a 0 square root of 3 over 4 pi cosine theta. And I think I've got everything in there. Okay. If you do the d phi integration, you get a 2 pi. So you wind up with a 2 pi over 4 pi. 1 over a 0 being the Bohr radius of course. 4 root 2 minus 1 to 1 d cosine theta. 0 infinity dr. r to the 4 e to the minus 3 r over 2 a 0 cosine squared theta. If you do the angular integration, you get 1 over 3 root 2. 1 over a 0 to the 4 equals 0 infinity dr. r to the 4 e to the minus 3 r over 2 a 0. These integrals are all well-known tabulated integrals. And so altogether we get 1 over 3 root 2 a 0 to the 4 4 factorial over 3 divided by 2 a 0 to the 5th power. Which turns out to be 2 to the 7th over 3 to the 5th root 2. I guess I could have said 2 to the 7.5 times a 0. Or a nicer way of writing it would be 2 to the 7th over 3 to the 5th root 2 h bar over alpha m c. So this h bar over alpha m c, if I recall correctly, is the Compton wavelength of the electron. And then it's increased by a factor of 137. That gives you the 4 radius a 0, which is 0.53 angstroms, a little more than half an angstrom. Any questions? All right. So we now take this value for the matrix element, and we stick it in here, and we've got this expression. And 
So when you substitute in Wonder Woman, if I could skip a step here. All right, let me skip a step. So we get W hat as 2 to the 17 over 3 to the 10. What's happening, of course, is that we're squaring the matrix element. That's why we get these extraordinary powers. I squared B squared squared over alpha C M squared E2 minus E1 over the volume of quantization X1 sub R over K sub 3 absolute value squared and then this final state health function E1 over E2 over omega minus E2. All right, now remember I warned you that in doing this problem it was pretty much just a straightforward application of the techniques that we had already seen until we get to discussion of the polarization vector. And here at this point we no longer can just turn a crank. We actually have to think. And so this always causes something of a crisis. So what do we have here? The sum, basically we have a space here, R3, of polarization vectors and they're spanned by epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and then we've got this third direction is the direction K. And this is easiest to think about if we imagine that all the polarization vectors are real and you have these two vectors and then that vector. In any case, what we have is the sum R equals 1 to 2 of epsilon R of K. This is an outer product. Epsilon R dagger of K is going to be the 3 by 3 identity matrix minus the outer product of K with K transpose or K dagger if you want, but K is real. Okay, so that's the expression for the sum of the polarization vectors. What we want is the 3, 3 component of this. So the 3, 3 component of this matrix element is of course 1 from the identity matrix minus K3 squared. And I should have said K hat 3 squared. And we took the Z axis such that our state was in the M equals 0 state and the initial state. And so this photon then is coming out at some arbitrary angle and this thing is 1 minus cosine squared theta where theta is the angle of the final state photon relative to the Z axis about which the initial state atom has M equals 0. Okay, we now have to sum over the momentum and spins of the emitted photon. And as usual we've done box quantization. K is 2 pi over L, a vector of integers, positive or negative. The vector of integers then is L over 2 pi vector K. And so a sum over the vector over the integers is L over 2 pi cubed integral D cubed K, which is to say volume integral D cubed K over 2 pi cubed. And so 
now that's what we've got to do with this. So when we sum over the polarizations, we get 1 minus cosine squared theta for this term here, and then we have to integrate the rest of it d cubed k and multiply by v. So um, I guess blackboard wise, I'll go over here. So what about a question? Well, 
when we finally get, let me just write it this way, two, we wind up with two to 17 over three to the 11, E2 minus E1, that's from the four thirds, cubed over alpha H bar C to the four N squared. So that basically is our final formula for the transition rate. But of course, we can compute E2 minus E1 because we know what the levels are of atomic hydrogen. And I know the energy level of EN are minus a half MC squared alpha squared over N squared. Or again, alpha is 137.036, I think. Over three to the 11. All right, so then E2 minus E1 turns out to be three eighths MC squared alpha squared. And that gives us a final formula for the rate, namely, well, our penultimate value of two to 17 over three to the 11, three cubed over two to the ninth, M cubed C6 alpha to the sixth over alpha H bar C to the fourth M squared. And as you no doubt noticed, there are ample opportunities for cancellations. And when we do the cancellations, we get two thirds to the eighth power MC squared alpha to the fifth over H bar. Now, the thing that has struck me repeatedly over the last half hour as I was writing these expressions is how, because the system is quantized and because the hydrogen atom has not only spherical symmetry, but also a hidden symmetry, so it has an extra symmetry. The formulas are particularly simple. They involve prime numbers to integer powers, and then a combination of fundamental constants that is the only one that I suppose you could have that would have the right dimensions, maybe I'm wrong about that. And then an appropriate number of fine structure constants. And so it's just remarkably simple that symmetry and quantization have given us such a simple result. The lifetime then for is one over the transition rate, and this then is three halves to the eighth H bar over MC squared alpha to the fifth. And if you put in the numbers, roughly speaking, MC squared is 0.511 MeV, so it's roughly half an MeV. H bar is 6.582 times 10 to the minus 22 MeV seconds, and alpha is one over 137.036. And so now if you put those together, you get a number that's very close to 1.6 nanoseconds. And so what we get from the four is equal to 1.6 10 to the minus 22. And notice that this is the experimental lifetime. Too high accuracy because the other, on the corrections of the dipole approximation would be down there in 
down there quite low. There might be an interference term which would bring them up to one part per thousand. Otherwise, they're one part in a million. Let me say a couple more things about corrections to the dipole approximation. If you take the next term, in our case, it's E minus I K dot X because we were talking about creating a photon. And this is one minus I K dot X plus I dot dot. So you keep this term. And this is something that you need to do if the original state was 2, instead of 2, 1, 0, if it was 2, 0, 0. If you were trying to do this transition, the K of the 2S state. Clearly, the 2S state is going to be a longer life, longer lived life. It's going to have a longer lifetime. And the reason is that this term is 0, and so it has to go through this term. And so this is slowed down by a fact that the amplitude is slowed down by 10 to the third, 10 to the minus 3. And then the probability is slowed down by 10 to the minus 6. So the lifetime is up by a million. So the lifetime then of the 2S state must be of the order of milliseconds, or the order of a millisecond, maybe two. And the transitions from the 2S to the 1S, there are two kinds of transitions. One is magnetic dipole. And the other one is electric quadrupole. And this is according to whether you have the anti-symmetric or the symmetric part of the matrix element. Remember, the matrix element would be 1, 0, 0, epsilon sub R of K, say, star dot X times K dot X, 2, 0, 0. And so if you have, so you can see that there's an Xi, Xj time gets multiplied by epsilon R star and K I J. And you can separate that quantity out into an anti-symmetric and a symmetric part. And if the anti-symmetric part is contributing, then it's the magnetic dipole. Otherwise, it's the electric quadrupole. And in any event, these are slower, much slower transitions. And it's still too fast to see with the naked eye. All right, well, the next topic, then, is the ionization of atomic hydrogen. But if there are questions, we can start with questions. Any questions? All right. OK, so the next topic is the ionization of atomic hydrogen. And remember, H0M is P squared over 2M minus E squared over R. And in fact, that's actually true. As long as we think of E squared as alpha H bar C, that's a way of writing it. Now, the final state is going to be PF, which goes with H bar KF. So this is the final state electron. 
and we can write this final state electron as a plane wing. X kf is e to the i x dot kf over squared b. So here it's normalized. And the advantage of using k is that it has the 1 over h bar in it, so we don't have to write t over h bar. And as usual, k is 2 pi over l. The vector of energy is n, and v is going to be l cubed. So once again, now what is our final state? Our final state is just simply k sub f. And then we have our s operator. And the initial state is 1, 0, 0, and some photon, k. Now I see a little blackboard ordering problem. This is then minus i over h bar, integral 0 to t, k final, e to the i, h0 matter plus h0 field, t prime over h bar. Then minus q over m, a dot p, e minus i, h0 m plus h0 x, t prime over h bar, 1, 0, 0, k, e t prime. OK. So that's our expression. And again, once again, the initial and final states are eigenstates of these, of the, what are called the free Hamiltonians. And so what we've got is then i q over h bar m, I'm going to take the matrix element out now. It's going to be k f, a dot, well, let me not try to do everything at once. a dot p, 1, 0, 0, k. So I can pull that out of the time integral. And then the time integral is integral 0 to t, e to the i. And then what we're going to have is Epsilon zero B omega K 
the one half, then there's going to be k final dot epsilon r of k. And now what's left is k final, the annihilation operator turns this into vacuum, which is just a factor of one. And so the final factor here is e to the i k dot x times one zero zero. I don't think I've left anything out at this point. This is the operator here. This k is the k of the initial photon. That's that k. And right, so that's the k of the initial photon. All right. So see, I'm having to translate from my notes are in unrealized Heaviside Lorentz units. Okay, so what is our transition rate then? It's when we do the integral, the ih bar cancels. So we get q over m. We get all of that, which is h bar over 2 epsilon zero v omega k to the one half. We have k f dot epsilon r. I'm just going to leave it like that. And then we have k f e to the i k dot x one zero zero. We still have to compute this matrix element. Then we have this phase factor e to the i e f minus h bar omega minus e one t over h bar minus one close parentheses over e f minus h bar omega minus e one. And when we take the square of that thing, that's going to kick out a factor of four. And then it's going to be a sine squared over an energy denominator squared. So p of t is going to be q squared over m squared h bar over 2 epsilon zero v omega k k f dot epsilon r absolute value squared this matrix element. Absolute value squared is a four kicked out from there. And then we have sine squared of e f minus h bar omega minus e one t over 2 h bar divided by the square of the energy denominator. So that's our probability. Everything, we know everything about it except for this thing which we have to compute. And then of course we have to use our magic formula, namely that in the limit this thing turns into pi t over 2 h bar delta function of the difference of the energies. Okay, so. By the way, why don't you send me email on what you want to see next. I think this is, for me, when I was a graduate student, 
the high point of the quantum mechanics course was calculations like this, which occurred in the spring. And so I can continue with these. In fact, what we could do is quantize the field of the electron and do, say, Compton scattering, which is the scattering of the photon off an electron, and do pair creation and a couple of other, some other calculations. But I don't know. Maybe you guys, and maybe do the Casimir effect. Maybe you guys want to see something else, though. So why don't you send me an email saying what topics you prefer to see covered. Okay. Let me get a drink. By the way, I was reading last night. See, I'm finally reading Jean-Claude Deal's quite correctly. He was complaining about the export controls. And that reminded me that Oppenheimer had made fun of export controls in the summer of 1949. And, in fact, Oppenheimer couldn't resist making fun of people. Making fun of people, and he was extremely good at it. And it was this guy, Strauss, who was a very powerful politician. And he was pushing export controls on nuclear isotopes. And so Oppenheimer said, well, you know, if this is an ambiguous thing, you can use anything to make a nuclear weapon. You can use a shovel to make a nuclear weapon, and he did. You can use a bottle of beer to make a nuclear weapon, and he did. And as much as they used shovels and beer and had Los Alamos. And then he went on to say, now, as we get to the issue of simply nuclear isotopes, I would say, well, that they're less important than, say, electrical devices, but more important than vitamins. Somewhere in between. And that's hysterical. I mean, most people laugh, but Strauss was really annoyed. And he then used his political power to ruin Oppenheimer. And my impression is that Teller was a pawn in that illumination. He might have been a willing pawn, I don't know. But the person behind it was not Teller, it was Strauss. And largely because Oppenheimer had made fun of him in his public hearing. So effective. All right, well, here is our expression. And we only have a tiny bit of time left in this hour. Let me just sketch how we'll do this, and then we'll come back to this calculation at this point. This matrix element, K sub F, E B I, K dot X, 1, 0, 0. Well, this thing, so I've got all these different notes. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to write that as integral D cubed X. And then we're going to put in here K F. We're going to insert a complete set of X states. E B I, K dot X, 1, sustained 1, 0, 0. And so this is integral D cubed X. This thing here is E to the I, K F dot X. Actually, it's E to the minus I, K F dot X. And the normalization is square root of V. And then we have E to the I, K dot X. This is the incident photon. And then we have R1, 0, 
how far, effectively, all the square would go by. So that's the way one does the calculation. And so you see, we're not making the dipole approximation. The dipole approximation, we replace this by one. Instead, we treat this part of the thing exactly. And that amounts to taking the Fourier transform of the ground state wave function of hydrogen. And so we'll continue that next time. I think that's about where we need to stop. Does somebody have a pencil so I can make a note?